Tonight, the real people. We had a pretty large bank associated with the uh, cost of the warning The real pictures. And there's one whole final that speaks to The real story of Apollo 13. Oh, here's the way that goes. It's a story of icy calm in the face of death. The odds were very small that we're going to get out of this alive. Of absolute refusal to admit defeat. We will never surrender. We will never give up crew. Of hope against all odds. I just knew he'd come back. An ordeal that lasted less than six days, but still echoes decades later. Every time a spacecraft splits the heavens. And liftoff... April 1970, America was convulsed over the Vietnam War. Airport was the big hit in theaters, and the news on April 10th that the Beatles were breaking up far overshadowed the moon mission scheduled the next day. As a matter of fact, before we took off, I think the only mention of Apollo 13 on the New York Times was on the weather page, about 97 pages in. Mission Commander Jim Lovell was one of NASA's most experienced astronauts. He'd been a backup pilot for the first moon landing in July of 69. That's one small step for man. Apollo 11 had transfixed the world, but then came Apollo 12, and now 13. Moon shots had come to seem routine. So you weren't front page news. Did that bother you at all? No, because this is what I wanted to do. Apollo 13 would bring back rock and soil samples from a hilly region of the moon, a much trickier landing site than those of previous missions. Lovell's fellow astronauts, Jack Swigert and Fred Hayes, were both on their first space flight. Just the thought of going to the moon was just so in incredible that uh, I couldn't pass up the chance. As Hayes and the others tell it today, none of them gave a moment's thought to the one thing about the mission that did catch the average person's attention. A lot of people just don't even deal with the number 13. They don't want to talk about it. Did it register with you at all? It didn't. I didn't even think about the number being superstitious. That is not true with my wife. My wife Marilyn said, why 13? It did bother me, yes. And I said, well, what happened to 14? But unlike an elevator, NASA didn't skip 13. Superstition uh, can't have any place. As if to drive home the point, lead flight director Gene Krantz recalls that NASA scheduled Apollo 13's launch for 1.13 p.m., or in military time, 1313. You were kind of flaunting the fact that you didn't care about superstition. I think uh, every person that was in this room uh, lived to, uh, to flaunt the odds. We were working on the ragged edge of all knowledge, all technology, and all experience in this room. This room was Kranz's domain, mission control in Houston. It had the, uh, the smell of the, uh, the cigarette smoke. I mean, we all smoked very heavily, pipes, cigars, cigarettes coffee pot that had been boiled over and had burned out. Krantz oversaw a 24-7 team of young engineers who controlled every aspect of space flight, the astronauts' lives in their hands. You guys had to look around at each other and think, we're, we're kind of a group of badasses in here. <laughs> I mean, you had to feel pretty good about yourselves. Well, the culture of this room was literally miraculous. It seemed that whatever happened, we were better as a total team than the sum of the parts. The same, of course, could be said for the three men riding the rocket, all of them former test pilots for whom mortal danger was just part of the job. When you became an astronaut, did you feel special? Did you feel invincible at all? I didn't feel invincible. I mean, the rewards involved overcame the risk that was involved. For families at home, a different equation. Did you ever get used to the risk involved, Marilyn? No, you put it out of your mind, but I can't say that um, it was easy at times. So the day before launch, you're out at a beach house mm -hmm. and get ready to see your husband for the last time before he heads into space. And something strange happened with your wedding ring. What happened? Well, I was taking a shower and I, it just slipped right off my hand and it went into the drain. And I just was terrified because to me it was like an omen that something really was going to happen. It shook you up. Oh, it did shake me up. Did you ever tell Jim about it before the flight? Uh, no, oh no. You would never let that thought enter his mind before he's about oh, no. to jump no, on that no, rocket. No, uh, for some reason or other, the astronaut wives just never discussed anything that, that would uh, worry their husbands. Um, 
before they went on a flight. I mean, we kept everything to ourselves. Several hours before launch, and you guys get in that elevator that takes you for the ride alongside of and then eventually to the top of the Saturn rocket. That, that's a long elevator ride up. It's 337 feet. Uh, just the crew, three of us, and a couple nervous checkout people are getting us into the spacecraft. Because it's basically a huge bomb that you're, you're riding up alongside. Five and a half million pounds of high explosives in the form of oxygen, hydrogen, and everything else. Any jitters? No, it's too late for jitters at that time. <laughs> Suddenly they say, you know, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. And those engines go, and you're on your way. We have commit, and we have liftoff at 2.13. Well, a liftoff, most people think it would be a big kick in the pants. It starts off very slowly because the vehicle weighs so much, even though it has a five engines running. Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it has cleared the tower. That's when you have your head close to the abort switch in case anything really goes wrong. And something did go wrong. One of the engines in the second stage of the rocket shut down prematurely, forcing mission control to make a series of quick calculations. Are the remaining engines all go? Do we have enough uh, propellant uh, to get the crew up into orbit? But within seconds, mission controllers determined that despite the malfunction, Apollo 13 was good to go for the moon. And I looked at my companions and I said, you know, every flight has a crisis. Something always goes wrong. This happened early in the flight and we're now free and clear of any other things going wrong. And he was right. For about 55 hours, 